Welcome to my Soul Series. Soul Series is part of Oprah and Friends, exclusively on XM Radio Channel 156. And you can listen to the entire Soul Series collection on xmradio.com slash Oprah. It's uplifting, enlightening, truly powerful. Welcome to Soul Series. So... Hi, welcome back to our Soul Series. It's another week. We're in the same outfits. <laughs> I love that. Because we just keep taping because our show's a half an hour. Half an hour is never enough. So we always end up talking for at least an hour. In 1999, cultural anthropologist and a practicing psychotherapist, Jenny Phillips, first set foot in the Donaldson Correctional Facility, which is home to some of Alabama's most dangerous criminals and referred to by its residents as the House of Pain. Now, she's done a documentary called The Dama Brothers, East Meets the West in the Deep South, the trailer of which can be found on Oprah.com. It tells a dramatic tale of human potential and transformation as it follows the stories of prison inmates who enter an arduous 10-day meditation program called um, the Pasna. So, Jenny, welcome back. Thank you. And now we're going to put on our headphones, okay? This okay. is the way we do this here. Because we're being joined by uh, by phone uh, are two of the Dama brothers, one of whom is sentenced to three life sentences. The other is serving life without parole. So I heard that there's only one phone in the room to pass between the two of you. Hi. Hi, hi guys. I'm going to start with Ben. Ben, can you pick up the phone? Yes. Hi. Hello. Hi. I, and they call you OB? Yes. Is it all right if I call you OB? Yes, that's cool. That's cool? Yes. All right. So, first of all, what did, how, did, how do you end up in prison serving three life sentences? What did you do to deserve three life sentences? Um, I got convicted of um, committing a murder and three attempted murders. How old were you when this happened? Twenty. 20 years old. I understand you'd come here as a teenager seeking freedom from civil war and, and violence in Uganda, which was pretty violent at the time. And yes, actually, I came here on political asylum. On political asylum. And you were riding in a car with some, some friends? Yes. And what happened? Um, the shootings occurred, and afterwards I got convicted of the principal because I tried to cover up. You know, and I tried to cover up for, um, for the other guys. And in the process of doing so, I jammed myself up mm -hmm. and ended up with the blame. And, you know. So that was when you were 20 years old? Yes. And you've been in prison now how long? Um, it's gone um, since 1991. 1991. Okay, so if I could add really quickly, that would be... Uh, 17 years. 17 years, that's right. <laughs> 17 years. 17 years in prison. What does 17 years in prison do to your psyche? Well, it's, uh, well, it's terribly difficult in the sense that I want Mrs. Um, Mrs. Family, Mrs. Being able to do um, things freely, you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, what do you miss the most? Well, I just come out here with the family. Family, you know. Camaraderie with the family. Yes. Mm -hmm. And being able to be there, you know, when people are needy and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Are there like physical comforts that you miss? Physical discomforts. Physical comforts that you miss. Um. Yeah. You know, like silence. You know. <laughs> silence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I often think if I got put in prison I would, or had to be in, kept away from the public in any way, I would think I would miss trees. I would miss trees the most. I'd miss grass and trees. Yes, I miss it too. Mm -hmm. I'd miss it too, yes. So what did you think when you first heard that uh, this meditation program was coming to prison? Um, actually, at that time, luckily I was at a, I was at a crossroads. In, in my own life, I was trying to make some changes, trying to find some, you know, I was challenging my own belief system at that time. So mm -hmm. And what what, what, what was your belief system that you were challenging? 
um, the belief system I was challenging was just my way of life. I mean, um, ordinarily we go about based on our conditioning, the things we've learned from childhood or that um, um, our surroundings have taught us, the things we've picked up in school and from our friends mm -hmm. and whatnot. You know, and I was beginning to challenge that because I noticed that in me, as well as in a lot of other people, people who are around me, it just simply wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was beginning to challenge a lot of things and to question a lot of things that I had learned, you know, mm -hmm. that I'd been conditioned to, mm -hmm. conditioned to follow. That was around the same time when the meditation technique um, was introduced to us here. And then I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time to, to participate in it. Talking with O.B., he was an inmate from Donaldson Correctional Facility, serving three life sentences. So with three life sentences, there's no chance you're getting out, right? There is a chance, you know, um, pretty meager based on the parole system here, but there's a chance, yes. So have you uh, basically accepted the fact that you're going to be there for life? Not, not in that sense, no. I mean... I realize that it's a possibility, it's a very big possibility. Nevertheless, you know, I do have an I do have a chance to come for parole. Mhm. Mm do you think that um you have you have been rehabilitated sufficiently to to be placed back into society and be a successful member of society? Yes, I'd say yes. Um, but if I'm going to speak about based on the technique of uh, Vipassana itself, I'll say this here. Um, Vipassana is not a cure-all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it provides a tremendous opportunity for one to grow, to learn, you know, and to for, for one to recondition themselves, one might say. Yeah. Nevertheless, you know, it doesn't mean that if somebody takes a Vipassana course, you know, they're going to be... Um, the saintly person automatically, no. It doesn't no. mean that. Um, people still commit blunders. I still commit blunders from time to time, you know, but what the technique has helped me with is to be able to see clearly. That's what the past actually means, is to see things as they really are. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, it's allowed me, given me more options, in other words. So you became a meditating prisoner. And when the program was first presented to you, so Jenny's here with us now, as you know, and when uh, Jenny and the two men from Vipassana came in and first introduced this whole idea of uh, 10 days sitting on the mats for 10 hours, being uh, removed from the rest of the prisons, prison population, were you up for it or did you think, oh, man, what is this? Well, well I was quite skeptical at first because I thought it was some kind of religion mm -hmm. and I was trying to I was try, at the time trying to shy away from religion yeah you know and conversion from one thing to another I was trying to shy away from all that so that was where my skepticism came from mostly mm -hmm. you know, and at the time too um, I had no idea how difficult it was going to be um, which I think is a good thing because if I knew how difficult it was going to be I probably would not have participated in it yeah, Jenny's laughing here now. Yeah. Because how how difficult was it? Can you describe the difficulty? Um, I would say it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And what was so hard about it? Sitting there and dealing with um, dealing with whatever feelings and emotions came up, and not acting outward with them, you know, as opposed to acting outward, it's just sitting there and observing them mm -hmm. without responding to them. Your feelings, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Did you come to terms with the crime that you are uh, serving time for committing? Yes, I think I did. I mean, I, I can't just point blank say I did, but I think I did. And why do you say you think and you can't point blank say you did? Because either you did or you didn't. Well, um... Again, nothing is completely in, uh, in black and white. You know, what I mean, right now, I think I can say I think I could say that I am peaceful, and I hope that um, I hope that um, the victims in the case. You know, what I mean, I feel really 
I don't know what the term to use is. But um, I feel I wish I could speak with them, you know, and where at one point uh, I didn't even think so. At one point, my thing was that I'm innocent. You know, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't harm anybody, you know. But then that opinion changed gradually, you know, as I began to see how, yes, even though I might not have actually physically hurt somebody, you know, my inaction could have caused that to happen. Your inaction and your covering up. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, and um, at one point I just refused to see it that way, you know. But then all that has changed over time, you know. And changed over time in that you now accept responsibility for the crime? Yes. Or your role in the crime? Both. Mm-hmm. Do you think you deserve three consecutive life sentences? No, I don't think I deserve that. You know, what do you think you deserve for your role in the crime? Well, um, as far as I'm his sentence is concerned, I, I wouldn't even know what to say. You know, it's not it's not a slap on the wrist, of course, you know. Mm -mm. Nevertheless, um... I don't know. I, I wouldn't put a. I wouldn't put a time limit on it. Either. How many people died in that shootout? One. One person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say you would want to speak to the victims, you want to speak to the victims' families. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to say what? Just to let them know that I'm sorry you know, for any role that I might have taken and for being so um, stubborn and, at the beginning, you know, um, being so hard-headed and stubborn. And, in effect, I think that's what put me deeper into this mess here. You know, I had um, a big ego, and I just wasn't gonna wasn't gonna fall. You know. So, if you could speak to the family, what would you say? I'd let them know that I'm sorry, and for whatever role I might have played, and for I'd hope that they could forgive me. Not so much, not so much, so that uh, me and them could be all right, but just for their own peace. So what kind of peace did the did the Vipassana bring you? Did it bring you some sense of peace? Yes, it did. Eventually? Eventually, yes. I mean, it's it's very turbulent. It's a very turbulent process, but eventually you do find peace. Yeah. After a few days or a few hours or how long were you meditating before you came to terms with who you are and what you'd done? Actually, it's it's an ongoing process. It's still going ongoing. on. Um, Do you still meditate? Yes, daily, twice daily. Wasn't there a time, I understand, when the person who was in charge of religious services there had become upset and you all had to let the, let the meditation go for a while and that some of the prisoners were secretly uh, meeting to meditate? Yes, um, <laughs> yes, that's true. I found that interesting, that people were trying to hide to meditate. Yeah, it was, um, it was a really wild moment, yes. Because what had happened there, Jenny? Um, hi, OB, how are you? Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Um, yes. uh, never quite clear on exactly what happened and not even sure, I'm not even sure it's that important exactly what happened, but by order of the commissioner of the Department of Corrections, the program was closed down. For a while. For four years, uh -huh. yeah. And that was when I received many of the letters that are in the book, because many of the men did keep meditating as best they could. Mm -hmm. And and OB is, is one of those guys who just, you know, kept the practice going as best he could. Well, in the documentary, the warden suggested that transformation might mean that inmates are faking it for the parole board. Well, um... What do you say to that? Honestly, there's always that possibility. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's going to sit down and go through the 10-day process, I mean, these are guys who, I mean, people who are here could tell the difference between people who are, those who are faking it and those who are not, because we live with each other, we live around each other every day, we've been around each other for years. So if there have been some genuine changes or some genuine um, attempts by somebody to change, you know, it's noticeable by the other guys around here. By the way they the way they treat each other. Not just the way they treat each other, but just by their their demeanor. By yeah. their demeanor. What yeah. changed with you, Obi? What changed? Well, I slowed down a whole lot. I started stopping at least and thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. Started giving myself more options. Um I'd like to say I, I think I think I 
got a little more compassionate towards um, other beings, period. Mm -hmm. A little more compassionate. Well, wonderful to talk to you. Can you put Grady on? Yes. Since you all are sharing one phone. Hello? Hi, Grady. Yes. Oprah Winfrey. Hey. Hi. Hey, hey, Grady. (laughs) I'm here with Jenny. I'm here with Jenny Phillips. Hey, Grady. Hey. Uh, So now, Grady, you've been incarcerated for over 20 years. Yes, ma'am. The first eight of which were on death row, and now you're serving life? Life without. Life without parole. What was your crime? Capital murder. Capital murder. Murder robbery. Murder robbery. And uh, you say you didn't actually commit the crime, but were a bystander? Well, I was there. I wasn't inside the building, but uh, I was there. And uh, I didn't stop it. Mm-hmm. So Obi says he was there and, you know, tried to cover up later and didn't actually pull the trigger. You're saying the same thing, but do you feel that, ever feel that your sentence is unfair? No. You don't? No. Okay. Why, I, were, you, why were you let off of death row? Uh, a luck of the draw. The wheel just happened to land on my number. Mm-hmm. Uh, I filed, uh, my lawyer did, uh, filed, uh, I held on to an issue for so long that he put it in my appeal, and I won in the Alabama Supreme Court uh, that Alabama was denying African Americans the right to participate in the Alabama judicial system. They struck all the African Americans off my jury, mm-hmm. and I won it. It was just the luck of the draw. It's the only reason I'm off. Did you at first think that the death penalty was too harsh, since you say that you were a bystander? Well, see, I wasn't just a bystander. I mean, I was there. I I, I actually carried one of the man's TVs out of his place to my car, to uh, the guy that took us over there, his car. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't stop the two men that killed this man. Mm-hmm. And like the DA said, and they had in the newspapers, I had two black belts in karate. I should have stopped him. Right. And the only excuse I had was I was drunk. That's mm-hmm. no excuse. I should have tried anyway. Yes, it says here in uh, Jenny's book uh, about you, although Grady did not commit the crime, he drove the getaway car, leaving the scene with the murderers tried as a capital crime and sentenced to death in the electric chair, narrowly escaped, Grady narrowly escaped execution in a retrial defended by attorney Brian Stevenson of Equal Justice Initiative. Grady was released from the death sentence and given life without parole. But there was something that really struck me about your story, I have to tell you. Um, And this is the part that really struck me. It says here, when you were five years old, one day your mother dressed you and your three-year-old brother, Danny, in their best clothes, drove them out into the countryside and left them on the porch of an old abandoned house at the end of a long driveway. She instructed them to stay on the porch, that Grady was to take care of Danny, and that she would be back to get them. And after standing there all night, Grady climbed down and found an old hubcap filled with rainwater. He also found a dead bird. These were the rations that kept the boys alive. Their mother never returned. In the days following their abandonment, Grady tried to care for Danny, who had a weak heart and had always been frail, but they were not found for several days. Danny later died, and Grady was filled with guilt about his death. Rather than blaming his mother, whom he didn't see again until he got to death row, he always blamed himself. Yeah. Pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Yeah. So, uh, during the process of meditation, did you come to terms with all of this? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely brought it all up. Uh, when you're sitting there, when your mind finally does, after that three days of monkey mind or whatever they want to call it, when your mind's racing, right, and it finally goes blank, then uh, you start hitting storms. On the fourth day of uh, inner feelings, uh, some good, mostly bad. So, uh, yeah, I went through uh, the storms with that, too. 
did it I mean it's it doesn't bother me like it used to what doesn't bother I don't you? I'm not, I don't carry the guilt for Danny that I did for a lot of years mm-hmm how old was Danny and how old were you I was five Danny was uh, three mm. And I think find it so interesting. As a five-year-old, you blamed yourself. You didn't blame the mother who left you there. Well, I was the oldest. <laughs> I was supposed to be the one in charge. Mm-hmm. I'm talking with uh, an inmate from Donaldson Correctional Facility, Grady. Uh, because you have no uh, possibility for parole, how do you find hope behind bars and was... Uh, Vipassana, a part of you being able to find some sense of hope for yourself, this sense of meditation? Uh, I don't think Vipassana was part of me finding hope. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've pretty well decided that this is my home. Mm -hmm. And uh, after being in it for so long, I didn't like the way it was. I didn't like the environment I was living in. Mm Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do something about it. But before I could help change any of my environment, I had to change me. And uh, Vipassana helped me to do that now. To change yourself. Yeah. uh, I heard part of the earlier part of the show, and you said something about not being able to sit there for so long because of the pain and the stuff. See, that's the thing during this meditation that actually helped me the most. Because up until then, that old thing about nothing's permanent but change, well, that was just words. Mm -hmm. But they make you sit there long enough to actually experience it so that you do realize everything will pass. If you just be cool, let it alone, recognize it, and move on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, It taught me a lot. It, It makes everything so much easier, and I don't have to have that crazy mind, you know, everything racing through my head every night when I lay down, I can actually get some sleep. I I, I think I recall hearing you say that, too, on the documentary, and I was really struck by that, too, because I never, uh, you know, I just never thought of it that way before, which I always love when I have a moment when I haven't thought of something that way before, on the tape where you say, this is my home, you know, all of us you know, in the outside world here, take such pride. I know I do in my own home and my environment and wanting things to be as beautiful as possible, as comfortable as possible, as peaceful as possible, um, as, as as aesthetically pleasing as possible. And so it just, you know, hearing you say that on the documentary is the first time it ever occurred to me that a guy in prison um, serving a life sentence, sentence would think the same as I did about a home. Well, this is a mini city. Um, The warden brought that up a little earlier, and that's what this is. I mean, this is a small town, and I I don't care where you live. Nobody wants to live where you've got complete chaos going on around you 24 hours a day. So has the has the physical the physicality of your surroundings has not changed obviously what has changed about the way you see it Well it's made me more acceptable and tolerant mm-hmm. uh, and it also I don't have to get in reaction so much mm-hmm. uh, and that was uh, always a problem of mine I reacted to everything mm-hmm. now, I don't react so much anymore it just kind of, it's okay. It's okay. It'll be all right in a minute. It'll be all right in a minute. <laughs> so when things are going on and people are challenging you, and I, you know, b- based on what I was seeing in uh, uh, in the documentary, and sometimes I watch Lock Up on MSNBC. I don't know, I'm mesmerized by it, where you just watch pe- watch the prisoners go in and out of their cells, and there's always something to antagonize you. You are able to immediately go into some form of meditation or get still with yourself and understand this too shall pass. Well, it's, it's part of understanding that it too will pass, but I used the first three days that she talked about the uh, breath on your lip. Yeah. It's called Anapana, uh-huh. and I use that from time to time. If I if something does upset me, then I just take a few seconds and 
do some anapana, and I can do it walking with my eyes open anywhere I am. Just recognize the breath on my lip, and it comes right back again. Everything's okay. Just give it a minute. But in this place, as far as challenges, uh, yeah, your bed's not made. You're in the wrong area. You say the wrong thing. You don't do something quick enough. You don't have your clothes on just right. Your hair is not the right length. Anything can be a write-up. Uh, uh, we call them disciplinaries. And uh, I haven't had one in 22 years. Wow. So, I mean, I know how to live in prison. Just do what you're told. But, uh, yeah, you get challenges. But, I mean, if you, if you just... I don't know how to say anything plan in there. If you just do what you're told, you're all right. Well, this is interesting. Uh, obviously, uh, Jenny's book is called Letters from the Dama Brothers. Do you feel a sense of brotherhood down there in Alabama at the Donaldson Correctional Institution? Uh, there's not a guy. There's probably 150 of us that have went through this course, mm -hmm. and there's not a single one of them that I can't recognize walking through the compound, and not by his name, but by the way he carries himself. Wow. And what and is about the way he carries himself that makes him makes him he's stand? He's at peace. It? He's at peace. Hmm. Even in the midst of all that chaos. Absolutely. We learned uh, while watching the documentary that your daughter was murdered when you, while you were filming this documentary. How did you deal with that loss? Well, I, I guess I did it like most people. I, I grieved. Uh, I understand that's a part of the process of healing. And uh, then I uh, called my attorney and asked him to help the... Uh, guy that got put on death row in Mississippi for killing her. Hmm. You know, it's kind of like uh, that story in the Bible where the guy uh, runs into the king and tells him, hurry, come outside with me. Your son's been killed. Mm -hmm. And the king asked him, well, who killed him? Well, this is the man that killed him. We'll bring right. him before me and he'll be my son. Mm -hmm. I don't have that much, I don't guess, but... Uh, I don't believe in the death penalty, so I want the guy that killed my daughter to get help, too. You want him to get help? Yeah. Well, I think um, there's a lot to, to, to be gained by listening to uh, both of you today. I mean, I think that uh, certainly a lot of people who are listening to you and, and uh, watching me right now have a lot of things going on in their life and a lot of difficulties and, you know, feel that there's a lot of chaos. Happy that we're not behind bars to have to deal with it, but um, the practice of knowing that it's going to be okay no matter what it is, being able to go to your breath and recognize that whatever the moment is, this moment too shall pass, is a lesson we can all take away from you today. So I thank you so much, uh, Grady, for a uh, talking to me today. Thank, Thank you. you for having us on. Thank you and OB. Thank you. If you want to see this uh, powerful documentary, Dhamma Brothers, you can go to dhammabrothers.com and you spell Dhamma, D-H-A-M-M-A, -M -M -A, brothers.com. Jenny Phillips, it's been uh, a pleasure to have you join us, mostly silently today, but thank you for joining us. Thank you us. for having me. It's, yeah, it's a I, can, pleasure. I can see you have, uh, you know, a real connection to these men because you're smiling the whole time like their mother sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> like, mother, mother, sister Jenny smiling, guys. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here on Soul Series. It's great. I hope you enjoyed this edition of our Soul Series. These are some of my favorite conversations. To hear more, sign up for a free 30-day XM Radio trial by going to www.xmradio.com slash Oprah.